Hello and welcome to the IND podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Dunicic. Now, before we begin today, I want to remind you to subscribe to our channel so you can stay in the loop on all the global affairs that are occurring today. Our main story today is concerning the Paris terror attack trials that have been occurring this year. Now, we previously covered this topic when the trials were beginning to take place and when the special courthouse in the Palace of Justice was being made for this court proceeding. Now, this is one of the largest trials in French history, involving hundreds of different lawyers, 14 defendants, countless witnesses, and a major media presence. Now, what is being tried is one of the largest terrorist attacks in European history, in world history, and the largest attack in modern French history. Now, what has happened in the past two weeks during these trials is victims who were present at the Batacalan Theater, which was one of the targets of the attacks, have been able to provide their witness testimony, giving a more concrete image of the logistical proceedings of the attack that happened. Now, I want to warn some of my viewers that the material we're going to go into We're going to be a little bit, we're going to keep some brevity on the details, but we are going to go into general detail. And what we are talking about is one of the worst, most brutal and cruel terrorist attacks that has happened in history. These topics can be dark for some. And while I don't believe in trigger warnings or political correctness, I do want to inform you that the subject material of this podcast is going to be pretty gruesome and gory. And the reason that we are covering this and going over the witness testimony, the victim testimony, and I'm actually not going to call them victims. I'm going to call them survivors because what they went through was a living hell. They're not victims. They're survivors. The reason that we're covering their testimony is to understand the reality that is terrorism, the possibility that is terrorism, and to understand that this is still a real threat that can occur today, even though, the, even though these attacks occurred over 16 years ago, uh, over six years ago, my apologies. So let's just kind of get into the basics of what happened. Six years ago, on November 13th of 2015, the Islamic State, which at the time was the largest, historically largest, most well-funded and well-organized international Islamic terrorist radical organization organized a night of terror in Paris, France. The attacks would be carried out on the Bataclan Theater, which is a historical theater in Paris, France, that in modern history has been used for rock concerts. Another target was the French National Stadium used for soccer or football games. And the final target was the surrounding bars and cafes. In total, 130 people would die in these attacks. Now, 89 of the victims of these attacks would be in the Bataclan Theater. That is why this specific part and area of the attacks is so crucial. The vast majority of fatal casualties occurred in the Bataclan Theater. Now, keep in mind that even though the death toll was 130, hundreds more were injured. And countless, an innumerable innumerable amount of people were permanently damaged and traumatized by these events. Now, this is something that has been analyzed over the past six years. Experts, police officers, investigators, a, a wide variety of specialists have gone through and recreated these events and exactly what happened. But in the past two weeks, the victim testimony that has been occurring in the terror trials, in the Palace of Justice, has been the first time eyewitnesses have been able to publicly give their testimony. And the testimony is gruesome. What occurred was terrible. Now, while the public names, information, and specific experiences are all available online, and this is public information, if you 
are really that curious, you can find this information yourself. Out of respect for the survivors, victims, and witnesses, and their families, I'm not going to use individual names. And I'm just going to kind of piece together the events that occurred at the Bataclan Theater, generally speaking, and give you a picture of what happened. The attacks would begin later in the evening. What was occurring at the Bataclan Theater that night was the Eagles of Death Metal, who, despite their name, are actually a bluegrass band, and the lead singer of the Eagles of Death Metal is actually also the lead singer of Offspring, to kind of give you an idea of the genre of music, was playing in the Bataclan Concert Hall. Now, it was a full house, which is actually really unfortunate. At the time before the attacks, it seemed like a great thing. Selling out tickets is wonderful for any band, but... After the events that would follow, this would be a very negative thing. A full house was attending the concert of the Eagles of Death Metal. Groups of young people, middle-aged people, old people were enjoying their night, drinking, dancing, partying with friends, just like many of us do on a weekly basis, once a month, or however much we go out. We're just simply enjoying their night, dancing the night away, drinking the night away, enjoying the night, listening to some of their favorite music and talking with friends. At 9.47, this would all change. Nine gunmen would enter the Bataclan Theater and they would target the center stage. Now the center stage area would turn into a complete massacre. A period of five minutes would pass where burst after burst after burst of automatic gunfire would go off. And keep in mind, everything that I'm saying is according to eyewitness testimony. Five minutes of automatic gunfire was heard. After these five minutes, the automatic gunfire would stop and there was almost complete silence. A significant amount of the people that were in the center dance area, the central stage, were either dead or injured and lying in a pottle, a pile of bodies, what many witnesses described as a mass grave. This period of quiet would be pierced by the occasional gunshot as the terrorists and gunmen were walking around the dance floor and the concert hall in general and shooting survivors just to get rid of as much people as they possibly could. An undisclosed period of time would pass when the gunmen would begin to go into separate areas. Now, nine minutes following the beginning of the shooting at 9.47 p.m. at 9.56 p.m., the first police officers would arrive on the scene. Now, the first police responding police officers were normal, everyday police. They were not a SWAT team, what we call in America SWAT team, or what they call in Europe special police or gender marines. They were normal, everyday police who only had handguns. Now, these original responding police were able to take out one of the gunmen before the gunman took out and executed a hostage on stage. The terrorists that they took out, suicide vest would go off. Now, more peri a larger period of time would pass through where the police would be able to take care of the rest of the terrorists. Now, this would basically be a hostage crisis slash gunfight, which would perpetually change stages as the situation uh, developed. During this time, a lot of the survivors were able to escape right at the beginning, right around 9.47 to 9.56, were able to just leave the concert hall, run out to the street, and go out into the general public to complete safety. Many others, and the vast majority of witnesses that have been testifying in the court proceedings were not so lucky. They ended up being stuck inside the concert hall. And they had to find different and creative ways to hide from the gunmen. Some people had to hide for hours and play dead amongst the pile of dead bodies, which as witness testimony stated, looked like a mass grave. Other survivors would hide in a janitor closet and only had a broom to hold themselves and the door closed between themselves and the gunmen. A significant amount of survivors would go into a restroom and break their way through the ceiling and enter inside the ceiling area and hide in the small little crawl space that existed between the roof and the ceiling until the ordeal was over. Keep in mind, these people were hiding in these tight crawl spaces underneath bodies or inside janitor clo janitor's closets for hours. Now, 
Near the end of the situation, the two remaining gunmen that survived would take 11 hostages and keep them on the top floor hallway from police. The gunman used one of the hostages' cell phones to try and negotiate a bit of a hostage situation or a exchange to be let go. Now, the French police played along with this ploy, but they were very certain when they took into account the events that occurred at the French National Stadium and the restaurants and bars, the attacks that occurred outside of the Bataclan Theater, they knew that this was a terrorist attack, that the people on the other line of the phone were not there to negotiate. And according to witness testimony, witnesses that made eye contact or made visual contact with the gunman had a feeling, and this is a very subjective term, it cannot, it has no legal brevity, but it is something that is relevant to state. They had a feeling that the gunmen they were looking at were not individuals that looked like they had a plan of escape. They looked like people who were planning to martyr themselves. And most of the witnesses there knew that what was happening was in fact a terrorist attack. Now the French police would play along with this hostage negotiation and instead of actually negotiating or giving the two gunmen what they wanted, they would barge into this hallway where 11 hostages were taken, throw in flashbangs, have a riot shield to protect them from gunfire, and take out, lethally take out, the last two gunmen, ending the hostage crisis. The last gunman would be shot dead at 12.18 a.m., putting an end to the hostage situation and the terrorist attack but it was not a complete end to the situation. It would take police more than an hour until they found and rescued the last survivors. They had, it took hours to find people hiding amongst the bodies. It took more than an hour to find the people hiding inside the ceiling, but these people would eventually come out and survive their ordeal. Now, it should be noted that these people physically survived. They aren't dead and, and they still live today, six years later, but Every witness is either physically scarred because they suffered a gunshot wound or seriously emotionally traumatized. As one witness put it, speaking directly to the defendants. Now keep in mind that every single attacker that carried out this attack, carried out the attacks on the Bataclan Theater, on the French National Theater, and on the neighboring restaurants and bars, either died or was killed in the following days. There is only one lone survivor from the original Islamic State cell that planned these attacks and was one of the original attackers. And the only reason he survived was because his suicide vest malfunctioned and he just decided to go home. He's actually the prime defendant in this case. The 13 other individuals who are being tried in relation to this attack were people that assisted financially, logistically, or a provided transportation for the attackers. But one of the witnesses looked at these defendants and told them, you've taken away my sense of security. You've taken away my ability to go to the park. You've taken away my ability to go to the theater, to go watch a movie, to feel safe. These victims, everywhere they go now, feel that they could be victims of another potential terrorist attack. And that, is a tragedy in and of itself. Even if they live, they're not fully living. Now, the reason that I wanted to talk about this story today is because the trials are still occurring today. And this is one of the most important historical events in modern history. It's one of the pivotal moments of the war on terror and one of the most gruesome moments of the war on terror. But in addition to this, something else is going on. The organization that carried out these attacks was the Islamic State. And while the Islamic State is nowhere near as powerful, well-financed, organized, or promoted as they were six years ago, they do still exist. They are disorganized. They have leadership disputes. They don't hold any significant amount of territory. And they've virtually been pummeled into the ground. There is an ability for them to resurge. And more specifically, this is occurring in Afghanistan, where the Islamic State, or ISK as it's known in Afghanistan, has 
carried out terrorist attack after terrorist attack after terrorist attack, most notably setting off a bomb right outside the Kabul airport during Western evacuations, killing 169 people. The Islamic State could potentially be making a comeback. And again, I am not doing this to create fear or be a fear monger. Go to movie theaters, go to concerts, go out, enjoy your life. Don't be afraid of a terrorist attack. The only reason that I'm saying this is that we should all follow the situations that are occurring all over the world, whether they're in our country or not, because they can have consequences that touch much closer to home than we expect. So that's how I'm going to end the report today. Keep an eye out on what's going on in the global community, because a global issue can become a local tragedy in the blink of an eye. Comment what you think. Comment how you think the trials are going to turn out. Comment what you think about the trials, what you think about the attacks, and comment on what you think the future of radicalism, extremism, or terrorism is, Islamic, Christian, or otherwise. Thanks for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you next time.